spend a little of it. Hello, Laura, we lost you. We lost Laura. Hello. We did. Hang on one sec. I don't know what happened, but we lost Laura. Hold on one second, please. I think she needed to click on uh, approve the recording. Goes. All right. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Go on. Uh, I got disconnected for some. I probably hit the wrong button. Anyway, <laughs> moving right along. Um, yeah, so tonight I, I wanted to talk a little about um, new approaches to thinking about reactivity in dogs, aggressive behavior in dogs, um, new ways of actually creating more effective behavior change programs for dogs, no matter what issue they're struggling with. And I want to do that by um, actually going into a little bit of depth about uh, my slow thinking program, because that came out of my own journey to find more effective ways of changing my dog's behavior or helping, actually helping them. I had lived with two female dogs who were fighting quite seriously. Um, and I had tried the usual, um, recommended strategies involving, for example, desensitization, counter conditioning, et cetera. And it really didn't work. It worked somewhat. And then, um, you know, so I, about 20 years ago when this was happening, I decided if we were all going to survive this, I needed to come up with better ways of addressing dog behavior because what I had was not working that well. Um, so over the years, um, I, I worked a lot with cognitive issues and dogs. And within the last three or four years, I've developed my slow thinking is life-saving for dogs program. And I'll talk a little more about that at the end. But let me share the screen here. Um, and hopefully everyone will be able to, to see it. Uh, let me, I just want to see if I can change the view so I don't have the bar at the side, but I don't see a way to do that. Um, all right. So slow thinking is life-saving for dogs, why it's important and how to teach it. Uh, this is the name of my program and it's a very wide ranging program. What it isn't is a blueprint. <laughs> I'm not a big believer in blueprints because every dog is different. The emotional cognitive truth of every dog is different. Um, so, what I prefer to do is uh, work with dogs and help them learn what I call slow thinking habits for a lifetime, which they can use in any situation, uh, whether or not they've been in it and whether or not we are telling them what to do. Uh, because these are habits that dogs can uh, draw upon voluntarily as needed. It's like their own independent toolbox. Um, so let me. Now, I, I like to start with just a little bit about cognition. 
just to make sure we're all on the same page and you all are, are with me in terms of how I'm talking about cognition in dogs. Uh, I define cognition very broadly as information processing. Uh, that, is, that is the generous definition, uh, but it's one that has now become widely accepted both for humans and dogs uh, because dogs process information uh, very much actually like humans do. Um, and this is a, a quote from Sarah Shuttleworth, who's a cognitive uh, research psychologist and uh, an expert in animal cognition. And she defines cognition as an array of mechanisms by which animals acquire, process, store, and act on input from the environment. And that is information processing. These mechanisms include perception, learning, memory, decision-making, but I add one to that. And that is a, I think, distinctive offering contribution that I definitely want to add to any, um, you know, any program, any thinking through behavior issues in dogs, and that would be social problem solving. And I'll talk uh, a lot more about why I see social problem solving as being so critical. Uh, this is a, a little clip from Karen Overall, a renowned veterinary behaviorist uh, who I, whose work I've loved for at least 20 years. And this is Karen talking about um, cognition in dogs. And then of course, we have the very smug dog over here <laughs> looking saying, well, yeah, I mean, you hum humans are a little slow to catch up because I already knew this. To do this, dogs are as cognitive as we are. Every bit of data is showing that domestic dogs share all of the cognitive states and all of the neurochemical signatures in their genome for neurotransmitters that we do and all of the mistakes that are in their genome. We underestimate our patients all the time. Yes, and I'm assuming everyone can hear. Nancy, could you hear yes. that? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. good, 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 yeah. To do this, dogs are... Um, so when I say that dogs think, right, and that they, they um, engage in cognitive processing, I don't mean they think in words, right? I mean, the way we humans think and the way our dogs think is quite different. Uh, but there is, actually, we know now a really startling amount of what I call cognitive parity between dogs and humans. But cognitive parity does not mean dogs think like we humans do. It really means that dogs process and interpret environmental information. And like us humans, they make decisions using this information in very sophisticated ways. And I've actually written about other aspects of this in previous uh, publications, which I'd be happy to share with people. Uh, one would be social referencing, which is um, actually gaining information from a third party to interpret a, uh, something that the dog does not understand. And actually only canines and uh, primates engage in um, social referencing. So uh, an important form of cognitive parity between dogs and humans is the use of what I call fast twitch thinking. And I'm gonna define that term in just a minute, fast twitch thinking. 
Um, it's one of those things, and this is very um, kind of, uh, it, it's, it's something that we experience too often in this life. Can't live with it, but we can't live without it. <laughs> Uh, hard to live with it and hard to live without it. Why? Well, uh, partly because um, fast twitch thinking lubricates society as we know it. And that is one reason uh, I actually added the twitch part to fast thinking. Fast thinking is a more general term because I think it better embodies the nature of fast thinking, especially in animals and dogs. Um, why? Because, the, of course, this is a cheetah, right? The fastest mammal on earth. Um, and we know that the muscles of mammals are composed of both fast twitch and slow twitch fibers. Uh, while slow twitch fibers are associated with long duration, muscle contraction and endurance, uh, think marathoners, fast twitch fibers enable quick, powerful contractions for much shorter periods of time. And uh, so the cheetah here is probably 99.9% .9 fast twitch fibers. Um, I like this term fast twitch because I think it captures the muscle memory character of fast thinking better than some other definitions or terms that I've seen. And so um, what is it about fast twitch thinking that makes it impossible to live without it, but hard to live with it? Well, first of all, uh, it, as I said, it lubricates society as we know it. You honestly can't carry on without fast twitch thinking. Just driving a car, backing your car out of the driveway, or knowing which lane to head in when you pull out of your driveway, that is a result of fast, twi fast twitch thinking because uh, you don't really want to be intentionally deciding uh, when you're in your car. Same with playing a musical instrument, even opening a door, reading this PowerPoint slide. It's hard to think of anything in life as we know it that doesn't require some level of fast twitch thinking because um, fast twitch thinking is automatic. It is blazing fast, it's largely involuntary, largely subconscious, and it requires minimal cognitive effort. You really don't want to be pondering the decision about what lane you're going to pull into. And that is why driving in a culture that has different practices um, is so difficult because it is a fast twitch thinking decision. Um, this is the why, why it's hard to live without it, but why is it hard to live with it? Because fast twitch thinking can be very biased. It can be socially dysfunctional. Uh, a lot of what we hear about first impressions, my gut feelings, that is fast twitch thinking. And basically it, it's very misleading. It can be very misleading. Why? Because it enables stereotyping and judgment biases. These are immediate assumptions we make about all kinds of things based on appearance, sound, context, uh, you name it. And then it's often inaccurate and it jumps to the wrong conclusions. So, Here's an example of real life fast switch thinking. And I have adapted this from Daniel Kahneman's well-known book on thinking fast and slow. You are out walking and you see a person coming toward you. And probably most of us have had an experience like this, right? 
uh, you see a person coming toward you and you interpret their expression as angry. Uh, you sense that they're going to say something very unkind to you in a very loud and accusatory tone. Um, these are premonitions that come to mind automatically and effortlessly. We really don't intend to assess the person's, the person who is approaching us, their mood or anticipate what they might do. Um, our reaction to the approaching person's expression is not something we did consciously, it just happened. That is fast switch thinking. So here is a version of it that happens all the time in our dogs, right? This is what I call a picture of canine fast twitch thinking. You're out walking, your dog on leash, and the dog is lunging and barking at every dog they see. Um, I, I mean, how many of us have seen that? If it's not our dog, we've certainly experienced it in other people's dogs. And so these dogs are suffering um, several things. One is I argue strongly that these dogs are experiencing what I call a cognitive distortion, right? Because they're doing really bad risk assessment. Uh, not every dog they see or encounter on a walk is dangerous and it's going to hurt them. Uh, this is a Shiba Inu, and this is a little uh, <clears throat> Boston Terrier. Um, now, Boston Terriers can be quite feisty, but uh, I, I think it's safe to say the Shiba Inu is not doing accurate risk assessment here. Uh, they're engaging in um, fast switch thinking because they are making very automatic assumptions that this dog, even though it's far smaller and it doesn't seem to be offering any challenging behaviors, um, they are assuming that this dog is dangerous and therefore I've got to defend myself by barking, lunging, growling, sometimes even biting. Um, this is a huge issue in dogs. Uh, Fast twitch thinking is a significant component of canine aggression and what we call canine reactivity. Although I have to say, I really dislike that word. I try not to use it. And that is reactivity. In fact, in February, I'm doing a whole um, event. <laughs> with Andrew Hale from Dog Centered Care in the UK on revisioning reactivity, how we talk about it, what it means for our dogs, uh, because I, it's not helpful. I, maybe someone will ask me about that in the question and answer period. But why is this a significant statement? Because for ve a very, very long time, We've been told that the only thing that matters if your dog is quote unquote aggressive or reactive is um, actually their emotions, that's one. Um, and that assumes you're not just thinking this is bad behavior and I need to suppress it. I don't do that. Um, but I, I think emotions are a big part of it, but so is cognition. And fast switch thinking is one of the reasons why canine aggression and so-called reactive behavior is often very, very difficult to address, right? Because much of it is largely automatic. Um, if you have a dog like that Shiba Inu who is lunging and barking at every dog they see unleashed, they are bypassing most cognitive processing. Um, and this is a behavior that they are engaging in automatically. Um, and it is, I, my experience is 
it is probably liberated from the original context that gave rise to it. And now it's taken on a life of its own. Uh, much canine aggressive and reactive behavior is largely automatic, especially if the dog has been using it, not just for months, but for years as a stop signal, a defense mechanism. You know, remember in dogs, most often the best defense is a good offense. And that's what many, that's how many dogs are using this behavior. So it is these fast twitch automatic qualities that frequently make aggressive and reactive behavior resistant to change by using desensitization and counter conditioning. Um, that I think in some ways they're targeting the wrong system. That's what I've talked about in other uh, contexts. But I think uh, we need a much more expansive view of what is happening with our dogs than that it is just coming from the emotions. And that's what we need to change. So it is precisely here that slow thinking makes an invaluable contribution to canine welfare, right? Because dogs with largely automatic, aggressive, reactive behavior have little or no ability to problem solve situations. And therefore they are doing very distorted risk assessment. I say this to clients all the time because 99.9% .9 of the dogs I work with are struggling with aggression issues that the dog is doing really bad risk assessment. Why is this important? Well, because if a dog um, jumps to the wrong conclusion and delivers a bite, for example, uh, that dog is at a much higher risk for losing their home, being rehomed, being surrendered to a shelter, or even being euthanized. Uh, so fast twitch thinking in dogs can be lethal. And that's why I talk about slow thinking as a potentially life-saving alternative. Well, what is slow thinking? Uh, well, duh, it's slow. <laughs> uh, it's very, it's slow, which is why we cannot use it all the time. If we used it all the time, we'd never get anything done. Um, so it's slow because it is resource and time intensive. That's one. It takes a lot of energy and effort. Much easier just to launch into the <coughs> automatic behaviors <clears throat> that we've learned, automatic coping mechanisms that we've learned over time. It is slow because it's very deliberate. Uh, why is it deliberate? Because it is associated with problem solving. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. It does, unlike fast twitch thinking, require significant cognitive effort. So studies have shown, I'm not, I'm not gonna, in longer presentations of this and in my course and in writing, I, I go a lot more into the science, but I'll just say here, um, it's interesting that studies have shown that increased activation of a slow thinking system, the brain using a slow thinking system can lead to improvements in predictive accuracy. And that's important. Um, actually this study Cabrera et al 2015 was done at the Mayo Clinic emergency room <laughs> with ER doctors. Uh, who, of course, have to do fast thinking all the time. Uh, but there was a little too high of an error rate, and they wanted to improve the predictive 
accuracy of diagnosing people when they came into the ER and then doing good triage so that um, you know we would know where to send them next. Um, actually introducing a slow thinking system did lead to significant improvements in that context. We also know, and this is one I'm particularly interested in, that studies of healthy human individuals have showed that cognitive reappraisal, and that is a term that is a big one that I introduce in my slow thinking system. It's revisioning, reframing, and reappraising. It is being able to process a situation so that you experience it differently. Um, and I, I'm not going to get into a deep dive about that in tonight, but uh, I would be happy to, you know, point people to where you can find out more about it. But um, studies in humans have showed that cognitive reappraisal led to decreases in amygdala activation in response to those humans experiencing negative emotional stimuli. Why is this important? Because it turns probably what we've learned on its head, right? Um, we've learned that the emotions drive behavior, that the amygdala, which is the body's you know, arousal system, it's the alarm system in the body, it's the fast track system when we're in danger and we have to act quickly. Um, usually, uh, people think we, you know, there's no way to change this. But these studies uh, showed that actually using a cognitive reappraisal technique, and it really was not that complicated, um, led to the amygdala, that is our neurobiology, slowing down in relation to an experience of negative emotional stimuli. This is absolutely fascinating. And I think really, really important for dogs. So uh, I wanna just talk a little more tonight about social problem solving as a slow thinking habit. <clears throat> Actually in my course, I, I tend to focus on four. We do one slow thinking habit per week. And of course it's a very multifaceted um, dive into the habit. There's different ways of facilitating our dogs learning this because there's not one size that fits all. It, you know, it, it's, and I think that's really important in terms of helping our dogs, and that is the ability to use what works with them, right? Social problem solving is a slow thinking habit. Why do I focus on this? Because this is exactly what dogs who struggle with aggressive behavior and so called reactive behavior cannot do. They are not doing problem solving. They are using largely automatic responses that are bypassing cognitive processing, um, knee-jerk responses, fast twitch thinking. So just briefly, problem solving is both a cognitive and a behavioral process that generates a variety of potentially effective responses for a problem situation, right? Uh, you've got several options, and this is why decision-making is a big part of problem solving, because we have to make good decisions about which option to pick. Um, should I pick barking, lunging, growling? I would say no. Uh, but what might be some other constructive responses? Well, how about, you know, activating some of my relaxation techniques? How about turning away 
and actually um, using a de-escalating behavior. Those would be potential options. Problem solving increases the likelihood that a subject, and I would say whether that's human or canine, selects the most effective option from among the various alternatives. And that is why problem solving also involves decision-making about potential alternative responses. Well, I mean, you could use this for solving a math problem. We're not solving math problems here. We are actually doing what I call social problem solving. Social problem solving, that is the issue with our dogs. Unlike logical problem solving, like a math equation, social problem solving involves real life dilemmas within real world contexts and often evol involves negative emotional arousal, like our dogs barking and lunging at every dog they see on leash. Social problem solving addresses real life problems, not just logical ones. And this is an example of social problem solving. Uh, it's very brief, um, not very complicated, uh, and it shows you it is you can use little experiences in life to teach dogs social problem solving. This is a video from a client um, whose dog struggled greatly with aggressive and what I would call, uh, you know, traditionally reactive behavior. And one of the first things I do with dogs who struggle with these issues is teach them mat training, right? So this is Simon, and this is Simon's first attempt at learning mat training. It's not the mat training that's important here. It is this little um, kind of experience he has of trying to figure out, okay, what is going to get me the food treat in this situation. So let me play now, this. this time, have him get, uh, get on the mat. That's Simon. Let's wait longer between each treat. And that's a great way to start increasing duration on the mat. So you may have to help him a little more by going over there and just pointing to the middle of the mat. Yeah. He, he's looking for the, that's fine. We'll let him look, let him think about it a little. Let him think and we'll see if he can offer a down. Yes, good boy. Good boy. You know, let's just pause for a second, because this is really what he just did is really important. Um, why? Because one deficit that almost every dog who struggles with aggression has is they don't have any problem solving skills. They have no right. problem solving. That they they are on that their behavior is so deeply habitual. Um, the barking, the lunging. I see a target, I launch. I see a target, I yeah. launch. They're not doing any problem solving in that situation. And that is okay. Considering what what is the situation, and then what do I need to do to access a reward? And so that little moment right there with Simon where, you know, he, at first he was looking for treats and then you could see he kind of stilled for a minute. And that was the moment when he was saying, okay, what do I need to do? Yeah, he just put his head down and thought about it. To access the reward. That is the beginning of Simon learning problem solving skills. That was fabulous. You were such a good boy. Yes, you were. Let's do that one more time. 
So I, what I love about that is, and, and this, this could be a microcosm of, I think one, one thing we absolutely need to transform uh, in, in the way we help dogs learn. And that is to give them time to do social processing, right? Because I know probably many people would have jumped in there. Uh, it's what I call over cueing syndrome, right? They would have jumped in immediately, lie down, uh, do this, do that, rather than give the dog time to process and actually figure out on his own. That is how they learn. Um, and it also, um, I think, gives them a little decompression time, right? Uh, we give them the time and space to process this in their own way. And he did figure out, oh yeah, I, I, I offered the down and that's what produced the good stuff. Um, this is a microcosm of what happens in many, many, many different contexts, but in which we do not give our dogs time to process. And I think because of that, we really hamper they're learning some really critical life skills. Um, that's why I think social problem solving skills are extremely important coping mechanisms that can help reduce or even prevent the negative emotional effects of stress. And we know that in humans, if they have poor uh, problem solving skills, they are likely to be associated with this whole litany. I'm not going to go through this list, but of uh, kind of dysfunctional situations and behaviors. Whereas if they have effective problem solving skills, uh, they are much more likely to experience enhanced optimism, self control, uh, higher levels of general well being. So uh, that is one reason why in my slow thinking is life-saving for dogs, a big, big focus of it is helping dogs learn social problem solving skills. And you notice I did not say train. That's a whole nother issue, the T word, right? Because the T word often implies a laundry list. And uh, this is a very different way. Uh, slow thinking is a very different way of approaching behavior issues. We actually learn as much from our dogs as we're helping them learn. We try to learn what is their reality? What is their truth? What do I need to, um, to offer to help this dog be able to process this situation in a socially appropriate and safe way. Um, so teaching dogs these skills is a very effective way to help them stop using aggression as an automatic response. Because if you're doing social problem solving, there are no automatic responses. And they learn to think before they act. And that is absolutely critical. Um, I actually love this picture. You know, <laughs> I, I have border collies who are herding dogs. And I just think, you know, if my dog, my border collies just go to the library and look it up, you know, we'd all be a lot better off. But this is, of course, a, a corgi. Um, <clears throat> and problem solving empowers dogs. Because when they are solving a problem, they discover what behaviors will affect the environment so that they can obtain uh, the desired goal. In other words, they learn how to use their behavior to make good things happen. And that is a, um, that is a constructive use of behavior. And they know all too well how to use behavior to give stop signals. 
Uh, but what we want them to learn is how to make more positive um, e experiences happen by using different behaviors, by developing more socially appropriate coping mechanisms. So this is another example of this. This is Olive. And actually you may, if you can see the, um, my uh, poster behind me, Olive was the inspiration for my logo. My slow thinking is life-saving for dogs logo. Um, she was adopted from a, a native reservation out west, brought to Ithaca, where she immediately developed uh, resource guarding, started fighting with the housemate's dog. Um, we, we quickly got her out of that situation, but she's a pretty high, she was a pretty hypervigilant dog, highly sensitive to environmental stimuli. And so this is, this, is, <laughs> this is the apartment, this is where she lives. And you'll see a workman has come in to change the locks, right? So maybe three months ago, this would have been a nightmare for Olive. She would have been charging the door, barking, um, not really lunging at the person, but definitely letting them know, you are an intruder, I don't like you. And so um, this is actually what happened. Right? wagging tail, <laughs> relaxed body language. Here's the work person and he's got a really loud radio on. He's going in and out of the door. Well, what on earth happened? This is, this is what Olive's human said. We had the locks on our apartment change today with several service people coming in and out. Um, after some initial barking, so Olive, you know, re at first reacted the way that she usually did. I'm going to bark and lunge at that person, but then she stopped. Um, she, and, and my, here's how I describe it. She was able to engage in social problem solving. She started using different coping mechanisms, partly because I believe she feels better doing this. And her human said, well, after the initial barking, Olive settled down all on her own. The human had nothing to do with it. This would have been completely unfathomable several months ago. I attached a quick video I took because I was in partial disbelief. And what is also happening here is that we have worked a huge amount on map training for Olive. And she went and got on her map. Um, in the hallway, even though the actual mat wasn't there. I mean, she does have paws on the rug, but this is, you know, she's positioning herself at a safe distance. She's not going right up to this person, um, but this is a genuine tail wag. This is not fake calm. And it, it's really quite amazing. Um, this is what happens when dogs learn that they can do social problem solving. Uh, so I want to end uh, just with a, a demonstration of some of the ways that I've used to facilitate dogs developing problem solving skills. And I, I do want to say this is only one piece of uh, the whole slow thinking program, but I, I really regard it as a particularly critical one that is facilitating dogs learning social problem solving skills. And I use an exercise called free work. Now free work has been around for a while. It comes from Sarah Fisher and her animal centered education project that's based in the UK, uh, but free work has mainly been used uh, to see how a dog moves, to diagnose um, stiffness, issues with gait, that kind of thing, coat changes, health issues, 
um, et cetera, et cetera. I use free work to help dogs learn social problem solving skills. And that is a use of free work that I think is the contribution of my program to the, to the larger um, developing literature on it and the experience of many dogs using it. It's a quite wonderful exercise. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna follow Wyatt. This is Wyatt. Wyatt has struggled with aggressive behavior. He's eight years old now, ever since he was an eight week old puppy. Um, and I, I've been working with Wyatt and his owner for probably about nine months. Um, now, right now, probably more like a year. Uh, this was one of Wyatt's first attempts at experiences at negotiating a free work course. Um, and I love this quote by Sarah Fisher because I think it captures what happens in free work slowing down all interactions enables the dog to process and therefore learn. All too often, we inadvertently rush dogs through those learning opportunities and overwhelm them by mistake. Um, and one thing about free work, and this is very, very interesting. You see Wyatt here, no collar, no halter, no, um, no harness, no nothing, no human in here. And you would be amazed at what a difference it makes when we enable our dogs to negotiate and process the experience of the free work course on their own without prompting for us from us and without us um, kind of very subtly cueing them through using the traditional technologies we use, like a flat buckle collar, like a harness, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, this is uh, Wyatt's first free work course outside. Uh, before this, we, we've done um, actually a number inside. This is the first time outside. And of course, being outside adds a whole nother layer of distractions and things that um, Wyatt could potentially react to. Going to you see, push his nose in. Push it. This, this is what we're looking at right here. There are many things for him to interact with in the free work course. Um, and if you really want to deep dive into this, you should take my my uh, four week Think Gifford course because we do a lot on free work. But um, of particular interest for this segment is this aluminum step ladder, which is pretty rickety. It moves um, and there's cream cheese on the top. And one of Wyatt's favorite foods in the whole world is cream cheese. So this is what is happening. Um, let me get over treats on top of the ladder. So that is Wyatt's first encounter with the step ladder. This is Wyatt's second encounter with the step ladder. And it's interesting, you might notice um, previously he was going counterclockwise. Now he's moving clockwise. And that is a significant change inside. Um, and we, we have the video to document this, Wyatt almost always, 99 times out of 100, moved uh, counterclockwise. I, I don't know if that's because he has some stiffness on one side, that would be a pretty good guess, and it's just more comfortable moving that way. Uh, but that would be one thing you would want to explore and use free work to try to suss out in a much more granular and detailed manner. But this is Wyatt's second encounter yeah, with the step he's ladder. He's kind of having fun. <laughs> <laughs> While he's tearing the boxes apart. Yeah, and again, I'm, I'm pleased that he, that when he's 
putting his paw in the box. It's moving. Movement is a little bit tricky for him. And he he hung in there with just trying to yeah. tear that box up. Those are and that's why it's human that you're hearing. You'll hear a little more from her at the end. So this is the um third. Um, this is the third interaction. And you notice why it is back to moving counterclockwise. Very interesting movement patterns in this. Um, so let me just show you what happened. That's a suitcase in the back. It's just got a bunch of old rags in it and it's got some kibble on top. It's open a little so he can smell it. He's got some kibble on top and then a like a little quick cheese yeah. stick. And it's it's moving a little. It's not real yeah. solid. Yeah. That's cream cheese on the top of that ladder. Oh boy. Oh, look at that. Yeah. So he's standing up on top of the step to get to the um, top rung of the step ladder. That's interesting. That's nice too, because that's kind of in a piece of equipment. It's metal and it's, um, he has to kind of commit that that's going to not move, you know, right. or at least try it. So that was nice. Right. So Wyatt had interacted with the metal stepladder several times by the time of this clip and always had four feet on the ground, but he had licked some of the cheese off the top. Um, and on this go round, he remembered the cream cheese and he begins to try out some different strategies to get more of it off the top. His decision to actually climb the ladder and you saw he had one paw on it first i think just to test and then he was able to actually put both paws and a uh, stand up on the rung of the step ladder his decision to climb the ladder is the result of this social problem solving and it was successful for him and this is an immense i would say moment of progress <laughs> Um, for Wyatt because potentially pretty scary. Um, and he had to weigh, um, you know, he had to do risk assessment. How much do I want that treat versus, you know, how scared I am of putting myself on this ladder. And he opted for um, getting the cream cheese. Um, really, interesting choice and an important choice for developing his confidence and also uh, for him to be able to use social problem solving skills in real life situations. So this is why it's human. And I think you'll be interested in her take on what was happening. But this isn't even a good term. Um, you know how you hear about dogs that are have a lot of punishment and aversive stuff that kind of learned helplessness I feel sometimes like why it has a little version of helplessness in a way in terms of he hasn't tried acting on his environment and then getting feedback and then adjusting you know yeah. what I mean but not not a lot of practice um, and I'm sure there's people that have let their dogs do that a lot but um with Wyatt it just hasn't been that case that much where he's been able to execute some kind of behavior, get feedback, adjust, so. And that is critical. That is why giving our dogs the time to process uh, a situation is so absolutely important. So if you, if you see more videos, <laughs> Um, I, you know, I show a lot of videos in my presentation, or if you um, take the class or my webinar, you'll hear me saying this all the time. Wait, wait, give your dog time to think. Why? Because it is so counterintuitive in most dog training programs. We want to jump in immediately and micromanage our dogs. 
And by doing that, I think we are actually being very counterproductive to um, the skills that they desperately need to learn. So giving the dog, giving dogs the time and space to act on their environment, get feedback, use that to adjust their behavior as Wyatt did and to get the cream cheese is the essence of social problem solving. This was a beautiful illustration of that. And so um, I, and I, you know, I, I wanna just say a little about next steps, but this part of the presentation, um, this is a border collie and of course they're known. I've had working border collies and sheep for 20 years. Um, never underestimate what might happen if you give me a chance to think. <laughs> Revolutionary. <laughs> Uh, never underestimate what might happen if you give your dog a chance to socially process a situation in a way that makes sense to them. Now, just a little on where you can go to learn more. Um, one is I have a webinar. It's a, it's a two and a half hour, much, much more detailed than tonight, but uh, some of the same, you know, some of the basic same information that is now permanently available on the Clean Run Learning Center website. This is it. Um, and it's available for $50. You can get uh, continuing education units from uh, for if you're a CPDT, I, A, A, B, C, and Karen Pryor all give CEUs for um, participating in the webinar. And these are the links. I, I think the, these are live links. Um, so I, I will actually send a copy of this to Nancy so she can email you the live links. You won't be able to click on this in the video, of course. Uh, but this is the Clean Run webinar. And then this is the link to my four week Thinkific course. Um, and this is uh, a link to my Facebook page. I have a whole post on the course. It gives you an extensive course description, um, what the learning goals are, what the components of it are, I have another course starting up on January 9th. So if you're interested in this, uh, I would welcome you to, you know, uh, think about enrolling, doing further work um, in this. I, I just think there are some big paradigm shifts happening in the dog training world, in the world of dog performance in the world of dog behavior. And I'm very proud and happy to be a part of that. Um, and in my mind, it can't come too soon because the main thing is helping our dogs, um, helping them uh, learn to negotiate this world that we've put them in and uh, they're given so little choice about. Um, and this is the, the Thinkific course, uh, winter 2022. That's the one starting January 9th. It's on pre-order because it won't go live until January 9th. So you can enroll now, but the course itself, the curriculum won't be available until midnight, I think, um, on 12.01 uh, a.m. Uh, on January 9th. So I'm gonna stop the share here. Um, and I don't know, how do we do on time? Oh, that's actually perfect. Um, so uh, I'm open to any questions, um, anything you want to ask, um, you know, I'm up for it. So I'm gonna, Nancy, have you been looking at the chat or do people, how do you want to do this? 
So people can either post on chat or actually ask directly if they're not shy. So who I, uh, this is Sally. I would just like to thank you, Laura. This has been really interesting and the club is so happy to have Nancy provide us with all these wonderful resources. So thank you. You're welcome. I'm, I'm very happy to, to do it. Yes, yes. And actually there are people in the, in attendance who have gone through the first course. So at some point they might want to speak up too. I'm thinking of Christine there. Uh, she's one I can see. So, um, you know, I think there are people in the group tonight that have actually gone through the course. And, and this is, the thing is, and I, and I want to say this, um, we need multifaceted approaches to address these really significant behavior issues in dog. Uh, one, you know, one program is not going to be the answer, the answer. Uh, and there, there are many programs that promise to be the answer. And they're not. Why? Because these issues like aggression and uh, so-called reactivity are too complex for any one program to be able to deal with all of it. Uh, we need a community of people. We need a variety of voices. That is one reason I set my course up as looking at these habits, which can, you know, dogs can use them in many different ways. This is not a blueprint. This works with many different programs. So I, I think that's one piece that is really important to reiterate. And that is um, really acknowledging that none of us have the final answer. None of us have the final answer. And that is important. Uh, you know, it, it is really important. Um, so anyway, I, I'm going to stop talking and I want to hear what your uh, experiences, comments, questions are. So I'll lead off because yeah. you mentioned you don't like to use the term reactivity and I know that it's quite a charged term. What terms, term or terms do you use instead? Well, I, I'm not, I, I don't have it all worked out yet, but I tend, here's what I tend to do. I, talk, I <clears throat> tend to talk more about um, how dogs are learning, what they're learning. And there's a lot of mutual learning. I tend to emphasize learning over training, right? Because, because and I, I actually did a, if you go to my Facebook page, you can pull up this post. Dog training is not a laundry list, right? Which is how many people conceive it. You know, a client will call, okay, my dog is doing A, B, C, and D. Stop it. No. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I, I don't work like that. Yeah. I want to find out, okay, what, what, is, what is your dog experiencing? How are they using these behaviors? What relevance do, does this have for your dog? Um, I also don't believe that we should just change dogs' behaviors because we can. Um, not all behaviors that we have learned we need to teach dogs are actually essential or even relevant to them. So I think there's a whole host of assumptions about training, quote unquote, um, that need to be rethought and re-examined. Yeah. So here's a question from Melinda. And of course, because I am particularly interested in nose work <laughs> myself, I am very interested to, to discuss this with you. Can scent work or nose work games help teach slow thinking skills? Awesome. And 
I'm sure Nancy put you up to that, right? <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> um, yes, absolutely. And I have a whole, we spend a whole week on helping dogs develop a relaxation response, right? A relaxation response is not just helping dogs relax physically. It is also a cognitive decision, right? We want to give them a relaxation toolbox that they can use instead of some of the, um, some of the choices that they're making now, like barking, lunging, growling, um, you know, that kind of thing. Breathing, and a huge part of that is breathing. I teach dogs biofeedback, taking a deep breath, which is the Karen overall um, protocol. And we spend a huge amount of time talking about how beneficial sniffing is for dogs. And it turns out, Science just in the last um, three or four years, studies have emerged that points to, of course, sniffing be, being the most ancient sense in dogs. It is the most ancient sense. And so when dogs are inhaling, when they're, when they're sniffing, taking in that scent, just like in nose work, it is actually priming the brain to take in new information. So it's not just that sniffing is calming, doing nose work is calming, and it gives our dogs fabulous mental stimulation and they're engaging and they're being a dog, uh, but it also helps them develop cognit the cognitive ability to process new information in a constructive way. Um, and that is a piece that I really want to emphasize. So nose work, fabulous. And you are doing all kinds of things when you are participating in nose work class, not just having fun Absolutely. and helping your dog, you know, engage in a, in a great, um, experience for them, but also developing their cognitive capacities as well. And their confidence, because yes. I, I cannot tell you how many dogs that I've worked with who were, in essence, quivering wrecks. Mm -hmm. And within six months to a year, they turn into happy, confident searchers. It is yeah. quite remarkable. It is quite remarkable. Before and the, the study that one of the studies that I reference develops this term called the sniffing brain. Yes, 40% of a dog's brain is associated yeah. with the sense of olfaction. So when they're <laughs> engaging 40% of their brain, that's, that's a lot of brain power. Well, and it's, and it's even, it has a greater importance even than that 40% because it is priming the brain yes, to take in new information. Yeah. So I think it doesn't surprise me that many dogs come to your nose work class and within six months, they've had significant behavior changes exactly. for the better. Yes. Yeah, yes. without a doubt. Yeah. And there actually has been research done which indicates that dogs that are not allowed to sniff become depressed. Yes, I agree. So their pessimism and their unhappiness with life. Yes, I agree. So the next time you wanna snatch your dog away from sniffing on a walk, let them sniff. Think twice. Yes. Um, that's part of that. Give our dogs time to process in their own way. Yeah. Uh, and I say I have to I have to make a confession, right? I seem to have had an inordinate uh, number of canine companions who love to spend 15 minutes sniffing one blade of grass, <laughs> right? And I'll just say 20 years ago, uh, I was not good with this. <laughs> My dogs have changed me for the better. Yeah. I am a much more patient person. And for all the reasons that I talked about and Nancy just mentioned, 
now if they want to spend 15 minutes sniffing one blade of grass yes we're going to do that whose walk is it anyway yes exactly there you go yeah so we have another comment, which is, I think foundation knows work is essential to teach them. And I, I absolutely positively have to agree. Whether you compete or just teach that your dog knows work for enrichment, it, it's wonderful for the dog on every level. Totally agree. Yes, yes. And there are many ways to do it. Um, sniffaris, right? Uh, incorporating sniffaris as a regular, practice. I mean, that is taking a walk with your dog where the whole purpose is to let them do recreational yeah. and decompression sniffing. Um, in my mind, it should be a big part of what we call decompression walks. Um, so yes, I, I don't think you have to do competitive Nose work, although that's a fabulous sport, there are many ways to incorporate it just in our backyard. There sure are. Okay, folks, who else has questions for Laura? We still have some time. Love to hear from you. What are you thinking? So I'll ask another question and yeah. help people collect their thoughts. We've had a discussion about the concept of impulse control, and I would like you to discuss your <laughs> thoughts about that with this audience. Yeah, well, I, and it's because I, Nancy and I have had a previous discussion about about impulse control. So um, here's my take on it. I don't use that term anymore. And I, I because I think like so-called reactivity, it is very misleading. And it has a real tinge of the negative, right? The disciplinary impulse control. Your dog has no impulse control who has ever really said that in a positive way, right? It's a, it's a, it's a tinge with the negative. And we use this term with children too. And I think it's the same thing. Um, I, I don't think, it, well, let's just put it this way. It is very difficult to modify our impulses. Um, and you, so if you have a startle, impulse, you're going to feel the startle. What we can change is what we do when we have them. And so I prefer to talk about um, helping dogs learn self-regulatory behavior. I talk about helping dogs learn self-interruption. Um, I talk about helping, helping them learn self-control what i don't talk about anymore is um teaching them impulse control uh you you and this is why developing the ability to think before you act is so important right because the the thing about an impulse if it comes from fear or stress um it's a it's a powerful one right and most of the time we do something and we're not thinking. That is what the Shiba Inu was doing in the graphic on canine fast twitch thinking. I see a dog, I, I have an impulse, so I'm just gonna launch. Um, we actually want, to, we have the impulse and it takes a huge amount of work to modify that. Um, but you have the impulse and then what you want to do is give yourself a nanosecond as a buffer zone, right? I have the impulse. Now, what am I going to do about it? Um, and that's where social problem solving skills are critical. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we have a number of options and hopefully we'll pick one that is optimal, not dysfunctional. Um, but I don't like the term impulse control, especially used with dogs. I, I think it sets up, it, it's misleading and it sets up a, a rubric that we can't possibly meet. I mean, you can't teach a dog to control their impulses. You, can't, you, you can barely teach humans to control their impulses. Well, yes, yes. And I, so my, much better to help, to help dogs learn how to problem solve so that when they have the impulses, they will make much better decisions about what to do when they have them. So that's why I use self-interruption, self-regulation, self-control, a uh, very different vocabulary to talk about those kind of issues. So here's a post. My Roddy grew up in a puppy daycare and when she aged out was a wonderful slow thinker. On walks, she began to be charged by off-leash off -leash dogs. We've had this problem too, by the way. And her slow thinking ability got shredded. She's six years old now and dogs where we live, they recently moved, are all leashed. Her experiences in our old home made her think that the best defense is to go on the offense. So I'm the one who has a lunging Roddy on a leash. Is it possible to get her to return to the puppyhood slow thinking mode? Probably not to puppyhood, <laughs> you know, because puppies, you know, they just love everything. Uh, you can't possibly get an adult dog back to that kind of exuberant acceptance. But uh, there, there is a huge amount we can do for dogs who worry about the environment, like your Rottweiler. Um, and uh, I, I am a big fan of suspending recreational leash walks training for the situation, not in it. So in order to take a leash walk, we've got to equip our dogs with this independent slow thinking toolbox before we throw them back into the situation that has caused them so much stress and anxiety. Um, I, I actually did a, a, a post, it, it was one of my most popular ones where I, I, all I said was don't throw your dog in the deep end of the pool. Yeah. Don't, don't do that. And actually for, for many dogs, a leash walk is one of the most charged experiences they have, partly because of what it means to be on a leash, right? We're taking away all their escape routes, they're often subjected to forced interactions. Um, they have developed a whole hi history uh, with, with being on leash that we're often working against. So um, I try to actually develop all of these slow thinking skills in other contexts than the ones that are like the most arousing and seem the most dangerous for the dog. But I, I will say, I could show you, um, and if you take the course or do the webinar, uh, there are videos in there of dogs who were severely, for example, dog, dog aggressive. And at the end of working on this, they are able to see a, a small, spaniel type dog on leash, uh, maybe 25 feet in front of them, look at it and then make the decision on their own to actually disengage and turn away from it. Um, that is immense progress. I, I can't, I don't know. Every dog is different, but I, I'm hopeful that it can make a huge difference with most dogs. Um, and so if your Roddy is lunging on the leash, first thing I would do might be to um, 
try to find try to do decompression walks away from meeting any triggers really work on some of these skills outside of the situation that the dog feels is so dangerous i'm you know it's hard to answer that question uh because i call myself a realist optimist it may seem like an oxymoron i'm always hopeful that we can help dogs feel better right because that kind of behavior that you're talking about in your Wattweiler, that is coming from a place of stress and anxiety. It's because, you know, the dog is not feeling good that they feel like I, I have to do this to keep myself safe. Yes. Um, but I, I also um, am a realist and I think it just depends on many things, how long they've been rehearsing it. Neurological, you know, the, the, the neural pathways in the dog's brain. I, I've actually met very few dogs that couldn't feel better in some shape or form. Whether that is enough, that is a whole different question. Um, so I would say, yeah, I would be, I would be optimistic, but also realistic. You're never going to get back to puppyhood. I will just be honest and say that to you. But it could be that what you can develop with your adult dog might be even better, right? Um, it, it, it's because it's coming uh from a a place where the dog has experienced life and now they're actually making real decisions puppies are just um often an exuberance machine you know everything is fabulous um that's great but that is not really making decisions about actual situations in life so um uh, I don't know. I mean, I hope I answered your question, but uh, and, and I'm I'm thankful. Someone just said thank you for presenting an introduction to a very hopeful approach. I hope so. I you know I I think actually I've seen more uh, progress or you know dogs' ability to adapt in their resilience using this cognitive behavioral approach um, than, I, than I've seen, you know, when I was trying to deal with my own two fighting dogs uh, with more traditional behavior modification strategies, which were just pretty much a fail for me. Yeah. Um, anyway. I would... I would like to take um, the example with the spaniel yeah. um, one step further. Um, I have a dog who's activated by stress, um, a, um, was from guide dog school. Um, the, as you said, the spaniel was on leash, could, could look away and, and make the choice to, you know, stand down, yeah. <laughs> lack of a better term. Um, and we have that as well. Um, but do do you think it, that there is a possibility in a dog like this that could, if they encountered that situation off leash, could make the choice to not engage? Sure. Yes, and actually, it it depends on the dog. You know, I've actually worked with dogs who off leash were fine. They were fine with other dogs, but you put a leash on them and it turns them into Cujo. Um, yeah, uh, and, and I, I work with dogs like that as well, but this is not the case with this dog. She, she will encounter a loose dog. You'll have that three seconds, you don't have four. She'll just nail it right there. Now hold on, no, one bite holding on. Well, I'd say in that case, you shouldn't be walking that dog. We're, uh, we're, yeah, yeah, we're not 
it, it's occurred in my agility ring when somebody shouldn't have been there in there yet with their dog. And they so maybe agility dog, is, is not a context for that dog. And if they are in the agility ring, they should be wearing a muzzle. I, I mean, there are just a lot of safety mechanisms mm -hmm. you could put into place, but also maybe rethinking, maybe do nose work with the dog because that the dog can do on their own, no other dogs milling around. And that's one of the fabulous things about a nose work context. Right. Yes, um, we, we, we do nose works and she, and she is quite good at it. I mean, she, she, she's easy for the handler. She's yeah. quite the, I guess the problem is that I have at my, here at my house, the dog training arena. And it occurred when I was letting my dogs out for a, a relief break that nobody should have been in there has happened you know, in that situation, obviously the management and I don't put her in those situations, but I'm always at risk if management failed, her not making yeah. a good choice. I've worked with dogs like that. Uh, they're called zero dogs, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a lifelong mm -hmm. project. Um, shit happens. I mean, that, that's the only thing you can say. You had a dog in the arena, wasn't supposed to be there, but that is exactly why you have to have in place and use all the time these safety mechanisms, even if, of course, they will fail because management always oh. fails. Mm -hmm. um, every time that, you know, a dog like that goes out, a zero dog goes out, and I'm not talking about your dog. I'm doing a more general description here. They have to have a muzzle on. They've got to have redundant safety mechanisms in place, right? Mm -hmm. That is the consequence of keeping a dog like that. Um, would that dog ever be able to go into an agility ring off leash? Probably not. This is going to be a lifelong um, issue. And I, 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 you know, I've worked with dogs like that, and that is just the reality of it. Um, and I, I, I think being willing to, you know, to do that is a, is a decision that not many people would make, to be quite honest. Right, and I willingly <laughs> brought yeah. her her back so that I could keep her alive and and. Yeah hopefully keep her safe. Yeah. Um, but I'm always searching to see, is there something available that I haven't learned yet that I can do? And, and so that's why I asked the questions like that. Yeah. yeah. If, if there's something that in, in the science and in the, you know, more um, methods and things come up, is there something that I haven't encountered that I can, you know, I'm yeah. still always, always working toward. It, and the answer to that question better. is yes. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely yes. And that study that showed um, adult, healthy adult humans had their neurobiological arousal processing altered <laughs> by doing cognitive reappraisal in response to negative, um, you know, emotions is a, is the case in point. But in the meantime, those safety mechanisms would would have to be in place. If we were working together, this is probably something I would say to you every time that dog goes outside, they have to have the muzzle on. Even okay. if it's only for two minutes. Why? Because we cannot control the environment. Mm -hmm. You don't know what's going to happen. And all it takes, it, it, this can happen in a heartbeat. As I'm and sure, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, I'm yeah. sure. Oh. You're, uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely, absolutely right. Um, we are, we have begun muzzle training and working with that. So, you know, her tolerance to, you know, leaving it on even when we're not on a leash situation. And so that's, that's where yeah. we're at at this point. Yeah. 
All righty. Well, I Thank think you. we've reached uh, our, we're, it's at 9 p.m. So um, I really appreciate you, you all, you know, coming and listening tonight and posing your questions. Um, I believe that I put my contact information in the um, video too, and I'm sure Nancy can circulate that. If you have any questions, just email me. Um, and uh, I would love to see you in a future class. And I hope this was uh, informative for you. It yeah. sure was, Laura. Thank you so much for your time and your expertise. You're welcome. On behalf of the club and behalf of myself, thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Have a good night, all. Yep.